Hello and welcome back to STEM for Girls by Girls in STEM. I'm your host, Serena Berry, and today's episode is our eighth episode entitled Girls in the Lab. In today's episode, we'll be talking about research, the different types of research, the scientific method, research competitions, and research and development. Thinking like a scientist is a very unique way of thinking. A scientist thinks methodically and uses a scientific method to solve problems. The scientific method is an efficient way of problem solving, and through the use of the scientific method, you can acquire new knowledge and solve problems. The goal of the scientific method is to explain, predict, and or control a phenomenon. The first step of the scientific method is to identify a question. A question is a problem or observation that you were trying to explain or solve. The next step is to conduct some background research or brainstorming. The point of this step is to determine what you already know and to brainstorm solutions that could solve your problem. The next step, and one of the most important steps, is to develop a hypothesis. A hypothesis is a prediction that answers your question. It's not important that your hypothesis is correct, because the main point of science is to learn new information and learn through trial and error. The best way to test your hypothesis is to conduct an experiment. A good experiment will involve an independent variable and a dependent variable. The independent variable is the variable that you manipulate, and the dependent variable is the variable that changes changes based on your independent variable. For example, if you're creating an experiment based on if exercise helps heart health, your independent variable would be if the patient exercises or not, and the dependent variable would be heart health, which can be determined by heart rate and heart pumping. The next step is to analyze and conduct observations of your experiment. The best way to analyze is by analyzing your data and conducting calculations or by creating graphs. The importance of this step is that it will show you what you have learned through your experiment. By analyzing the data, you can develop a conclusion which should be an answer to your original question. Now that we have learned the steps of the scientific method, we will apply it to a case study of an experiment that I conducted when I job shadowed a cardiologist. The question that I was trying to solve or to explain was if exercise helps heart health. Through this experiment, I was hoping to learn how we can evaluate effects of exercise on heart function, how I could use this data to help patients, and what the potential benefits of exercise are. Some of the background information that I had to learn was how the heart pumps and the pumping function of the heart. So how the heart circulates blood is that it first receives non-oxygenated blood through the superior and inferior vena cava. This deoxygenated blood then goes to the right atrium and it goes through the tricuspid valve into the right ventricle. The right ventricle pumps the blood through the pulmonary artery, which then takes the blood to the lungs where it becomes oxygenated through gas exchange. Next, the oxygenated blood enters the heart through the pulmonary veins and enters the left atrium. After it's in the left atrium, it passes through the mitral valve and enters the left ventricle. After the left ventricle, it is pumped through the aorta, which then pumps the oxygenated blood to the rest of the body. Blood is very important in the body because it carries oxygen, which is necessary for all organs to use. Some of the other background research I did was to understand what cardiology techniques are used that can assess the health of the heart. The first cardiology technique I learned about was electrocardiography, or EKGs. EKGs measure the electrical activity of the heart. The electrical activity of the heart is what tells the heart to constrict during systole or to rest during diastole. A special type of EKG is called a stress EKG, in which case electrodes are placed on a patient while they exercise on a treadmill. Stress EKGs are important because they give us data on heart rate, which is beats per minute, and it can tell us the heart rate during rest, exercise, and recovery. Echocardiography is another technique, and it's basically an ultrasound of the heart. How an ultrasound works is it uses an ultrasound probe, which sends sound waves from the probe throughout the body and then receives echoing signals back. These signals are then used to generate an image. For example, the ultrasound signal can strike a red blood cell, and then this signal is delivered as a pulse wave Doppler signal. Pulse wave Doppler will basically show you the movement of blood throughout the heart. 
By tracing the pulse wave Doppler, we can get the area under the curve, which is a calculation that the machine will do for you that represents the velocity time integral. The velocity time integral is very important because it can be used in other calculations like finding cardiac output and stroke volume, which will tell you how much blood is being pumped through the left ventricle outflow tract, or LVOT. After we did this background, we had to create a hypothesis, and our hypothesis was that exercise would help the health of the heart. To test the hypothesis, we conducted an EKG stress test. An EKG stress test setup looks like a patient exercising on a treadmill while they are attached to electrodes. The electrodes will pick up on the electrical activity of the heart and display the data on the screen. By tracing the treadmill speed and the heart rate, you can see that as the treadmill speed increases, the patient's heart rate also increases. This is because as the treadmill speed increases, the heart is being put under more stress and strain and therefore requires more blood to be pumped throughout the body to replace the depleted oxygen. You can also see the heart rate during rest, during exercise, and during recovery. Recovery is when the heart moves from its stress-induced state during exercise back to rest rest. After conducting the experiment, it's important to analyze your data. So to analyze the data, we conducted two calculations. One was to find the stroke volume, which we found using the velocity time integral, and the other was to find the cardiac output, which we found using the stroke volume calculation times the heart rate. As you can see, during exercise, the stroke volume and cardiac output are much higher than during rest. What this means is that during exercise, your heart is pumping more blood throughout your body than during rest. From the analysis of this data, we made certain conclusions, and that conclusion was that proper exercise can help the pumping and heart health. We made this conclusion based on the fact that a normal heart pumps about five to six liters of blood every minute while at rest. However, during exercise, it's almost double that at 11 to 12 liters every minute. This shows that exercise can increase the amount of blood being pumped per minute. We also saw that electrocardiography and echocardiography can be used to assess the health of the heart. Now that we know how to use the scientific method, there are many research competitions that high school students can participate in to get involved. For example, there is the Junior Science in Humanities Symposia, or JSHS. This is designed to challenge and engage students from grades 9 to 12. There is also Regeneron, which is the oldest STEM research competition for seniors. Next, there is Genius Olympiad, which is an international high school project competition about environmental issues. There's also the Google Science Fair, which is the top math and science talent competition. And finally, there is the Massachusetts Science and Engineering Fair, which is for middle and high school students. And there are many others out there, so if you want to get involved, participating in research competitions is a great way. Now we're going to talk about two types of research, basic research and applied research. Basic research involves laboratory research, the development of a theory, and it produces a concept. Applied research is field research, it addresses current problems and provides data. Basic research addresses the question, why is it important and why it works, and applied research addresses the question, how can I use it and what works? Types of lab equipment include microscopy, spectroscopy, wet chemistry, rheology, and mechanical testing. One important aspect that you might not consider as lab equipment but is actually super important in the lab is your laboratory notebook. This is because this is where you will write down all of your observations, any calculations, and any data that you collect during your experiment. Basic research and applied research go hand in hand and eventually lead to development. Development involves designing, prototyping, testing, and the creation of a project. R&D is very innovative and is usually undertaken by organizations or companies that are looking to develop new services or products or improve existing ones. To talk to us more about research and development, we have a special guest interview with Piyush Modak, who is the Vice President of Research and Development at Endomedics. She led the development of scientific and technical breakthroughs and owns multiple patents. Her invention is a tunable bipolymer hydrogel produced from two processed natural polysaccharides for use as hemostat in biosurgery. What this means is that it is a gel that prevents bleeding. She has also built a team of scientific contributors in chemistry, characterization techniques, and purification and chemical engineering. Now we will take a look at this interview. 
Um, hello and welcome back. Today I am joined with Piyush Modak, who is the VP of R&D at Endomedics. Thank you for being here. Thank you for having me, Serena. So um, you have led the development of multiple scientific and technical breakthroughs in specialized polysaccharide chemistry for biosurgical application. Can you please share with us your journey through the research and development cycle and your goals towards the next steps? Sure, uh, thanks for the uh, leading question. Um, so uh, when I joined the company, I joined it right out of school. Uh, as a lab laboratory engineer right after my master's in biomedical engineering. And um, when I joined the company, we had a basic technology um, based on certain polysaccharides and it worked sometimes, it wasn't consistent. Uh, so we spent a couple of years working on that technology, trying to make it work uh, for different applications. And we, um, at one point in time, we were like, okay, this cannot happen. Uh, and we had to pivot as a company and as the goal of the company had to pivot. So we had this idea of having two sugar chains. That's what polysaccharides is. It's a chain of sugars that uh, form a network uh, when you mix them in situ. And this idea was very, um, appealing because you could use the technology for multiple uh, applications. Um, so we worked on that technology quite a bit. Um, one of the chain of sugars is called chitosin and it actually comes from shrimp and crab shells. Um, and then the other one is actually uh, manufactured from bacteria. So these are both natural polysaccharides and um, using natural polysaccharides is advantageous because it's biocompatible for your body, so it doesn't cause any negative effects when it's used in your body. And what we had to develop was the characterization of these sugar chains. Uh, what that means is we had to describe the property, how long the chain is and how many uh, reactive groups are there on the chain, um, how to produce them in a consistent manner, um, how to do chemistry on them to make it water soluble, and whatever the product was formed in the end, how to develop the uh, test methodology, the bench testing to test the final product. Um, and we had to do that from zero to 100 uh, very quickly, because even though, um, we were in a applied research uh, kind of environment. We were trying to develop a product and we had to make sure that um, the production and the processes are consistent. And that's what the key is when you go from research to development. Um, so I started as a lab engineer. I developed uh, a lot of the bench testing that had to be developed for the end product. Um, I worked with an expert team of polymer and synthetic chemists and small molecule chemists, spectroscopists, to get their inputs and develop this technology to where it is today. Um, and right now we can manufacture it at a lab scale and use that material to do a lot of testing. And the next uh, step that we are going to go to is manufacturing it at a larger scale um, so that we can make more of it, so we can sell the product to the hospitals and the surgeons to stop bleeding during surgery. Um, and since this is going to be a FDA approved product, uh, we have to go through a lot of testing after manufacturing. Um, so in the future, we will do a lot of uh, testing right from the cells, tissues, animals, then clinical trials, and then ultimately we can launch our product. Um, so we have to go through a lot of these steps to actually uh, help uh, launch our product, get it into the hands of surgeons to stop bleeding during surgery. 
Yeah, I think that's a really important point that you made that your company had to pivot because a lot of science is trial and error and things don't always work out on the first go. So part of being a researcher and a scientist is to recognize what went wrong and how you can fix that. Exactly. Um, and, you know, you learn as much or sometimes more from failed experiments than you learn from the ones that were successful. Yes, definitely. So currently you have three patents and two publications under your belt. What are some of the success factors that students can learn from you and apply in STEM? So um, when I was your age, uh, I never thought that I would be an inventor. Um, it kind of happened serendipitously, um, I would say. Um, so. I actually have, my undergrad is in computer science and I kind of switched my field to biomedical engineering. And I was in an environment in my current position uh, that was developing a product that nobody had ever done before. So whenever you try to do things that nobody had ever done before, you end up innovating a lot of things. Now the technology itself is innovative, but how it stops the bleeding, or as we call it as the mechanism of action is innovative, how we manufacture the product is innovative. Um, so what happened while working with that, we had to develop a lot of the technology uh, to analyze the product. We had to develop a lot of techniques that went into an analysis of the product. Um, and then, you know, the patent, usually for a company is important to protect what your technology is. So nobody else, well, first of all, you invent something new, which we did, but the patent protects other people, uh, protects you from other people trying to replicate what you did. And when you work for a startup, um, that's really key, um, especially when people wanna invest money um, your the number of patents that you have uh, really protects your IP and that's critical. Um, we also publish papers so that we can uh, make other people understand what our technology is about. Uh, so what I would, um, as a piece of advice, if you do want to become an inventor, I think your goal should be to uh, be in an environment that promotes innovation, be it, be it a research lab in academia or a startup company or, um, you know, anywhere where you get an opportunity to develop a solution for something that nobody has thought of. Um, and by being in that environment, it can push you definitely to become an inventor of your own. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I definitely agree. As a student, I've had opportunities to work in labs, and that has really taught me how to think like a scientist, like you said. So um, you established your own research lab from the ground up. What are some of the techniques and equipments that you use in your research fields of chemistry and material science? So, um, uh, you know, as I mentioned before, when I joined the lab, uh, we had some equipment but um, we had to decide what we need for developing this technology to actually know what kind of uh, techniques we need to apply to this technology. What I mean by that is, you know, you have this backbone of sugars. Um, now you want to analyze using different spectroscopy techniques, which um, basically uses different regions in the electromagnetic spectrum. So you have UV, you have IR, um, and you, you know, we had to develop some uh, techniques using the UV machine um, to determine when the reaction is over. So we had to develop that. Um, the IR, uh, we had to again look at when our reaction is finished, which means how many groups we have added to the backbone of the molecular, so we use IR for that. Um, and believe it or not, in our lab, we still use manual titrations 
using burettes. Um, and we have developed our own algorithm to determine using either potentiometric titrations or colorimetric titrations, um, again, how many functional groups we have on that backbone. Um, so now that's on the material science kind of aspect. We also had to develop bench testing for the end product, which is the device or the gel. So we had to develop our own um, machine, so to speak, um, to test the cohesive strength or the burst strength, how strong the gel is when you apply it on blood. It has to be strong enough to stop blood. So we had to develop our own machine that would test that. And um, we also had to get a um, rheometer. Now, I'm not sure if you're familiar with the rheometer. Rheometer measures the rheology of different polymers. Uh, uh, it's a response as, um, as you keep adding shear to the material. Now that also investigates different properties. So starting from the raw material up until the end product, um, you need to decide what property you want to investigate. And then depending on that, you have to invest money in getting the equipment, time and resources in developing the uh, techniques uh, specific to each instrument. Mm -hmm. And that actually leads right into my next question. So one of, you know, the challenges of creating a new product in research and development is this issue of funding. So how do you design study plans and apply for grants for funding? That's a very good question because, you know, without money, we can't buy a $100,000 machine, uh, which is needed to do the research. So, um, in, and this is specific to my startup, but in general, this is how people do it. Um, we look for a lot of grants, and since this is a healthcare company, um, NIH, which is the National Institutes of Health, um, or NSF, which is the National Science Foundation, actually funds a lot of grants through a mechanism called the Small Business Innovation Research. And we have received about $3.2 million worth of NIH grants um, to support our work. Um, we also, um, to get these grants, you have to have some data, which you write in a grant application. It's always a teamwork. Um, and then you submit uh, to the NIH. If they like your grant, they fund you. And we were lucky enough that they funded quite a bit, a bit of our research. Um, the other aspect of funding is, you know, um, asking investors to invest in your company. In a startup, um, you kind of have a bit of both. We like the government funding because it's what we call as non-dilutive funding, which means they don't own a piece of the company. And you get to investors. Um, the investors get a piece of the company uh, for whatever money they invest in. And we were lucky enough to get a lot of surgeons because they were going to be our eventual customer to invest in our company because they were very, uh, they understood the need of the uh, product. And so we were able to get money from private investors as well. So it is, you know, usually a combination of both. Um, with the, um, with respect to your question about the study plans, usually you don't design study plans for a particular grant, uh, per se, at least this is the small business perspective. Um, you take the data that you have and you, um, communicate it in a way that's coherent enough to understand that you have achieved enough success for this to be a fundable opportunity. And that's specifically for small business. And that might differ from what they have in academia, but in small business, usually the study plans are geared towards getting to the final point, which is getting the product. Uh, and then in the middle of the cycle, when you have enough data, you apply for grant funding. Um, so that, that there's a difference there. 
Yeah, that's really interesting to hear what funding is like from a small business perspective. I know me as a student, I have actually gotten grants from my university to fund research and research projects within a lab. So it's really interesting to hear sort of the differences. Yeah, so, absolutely. But money is money, right? Mm -hmm, yep. <laughs> So um, like you mentioned before, you transitioned from a computer science background in undergrad to research and biomedicine. So um, how do you think your engineering background has helped you in research and what are some of the skills needed to be a successful scientist? So that's a great question. Uh, something that I have thought about uh, quite a bit, uh, having the unusual background. Uh, I, I think I would describe myself as a engineer scientist combo. Um, so uh, in my undergrad in computer science, one of the basic things that I did learn was critical thinking or problem solving skills. And um, that was a great uh, experience to have. Uh, and one of the things that was unique to computer science, um, I think, was understanding data. Um, you know, how data is collected and how you make decisions on as little data as possible. Uh, something that, you know, they kind of teach you in school, but you kind of don't understand it, but then later on you do. Um, so understanding data and the structured way of problem solving definitely helped me uh, in my current job and in being a good scientist. Um, I would say that that has helped me, that has shaped the way I look at um, data as a scientist. Uh, usually I can see the curves from a set of numbers before we can chart them, and that's something that uh, has definitely helped me. Um, advice to how do you become a good scientist? Now that's difficult uh, uh, to describe sometimes, but I'll give it a shot. Uh, one thing that is important is to be curious. Um, you know, all scientists are curious, uh, no matter what, because they're always investigating or trying to understand, either trying to understand a phenomena or trying to solve some kind of a problem. Um, so, you know, be curious, never give up that curiosity that you had as a kid. Keep asking questions and, um, that's one thing. The second thing is, you know, develop your problem solving or critical thinking skills. Now, it's easier said than done. Uh, it's not something that you can read on a book or Google and have critical thinking skills tomorrow. So my biggest piece of advice is do as many projects as you can which are related to problem solving. Be it, it doesn't matter what field, you could do a computer coding problem, you could do a biology problem, a chemistry problem, get yourself involved in as many hands-on projects as you can. And just by going through that process of doing these projects, you will automatically gain uh, the skills of solving a problem. Maybe you won't do well on the first try, but you will always take these lessons with you to your next project. And that's what it's really about uh, is, you know, curiosity and your critical thinking skills that you will retain um, for the rest of your life. And the third thing is always something, the concept we use in quality is continuous improvement. Okay, so try to be better than what you were yesterday. Try to be a better problem solver tomorrow. Uh, you know, uh, look at a problem differently, do better. So that would be my advice to young generation today. Yeah, I completely agree in the importance of curiosity and critical thinking. And I especially like how you mentioned that, you know, you learn all these things in school, but you might not know how to apply them. So through research, you actually get those thinking skills and how to approach a problem and solve it. Um, so you have a passion for teaching STEM and volunteering. How was your experience in working with underprivileged kids in STEM education? So uh, I had a great opportunity to um, volunteer at a school uh, where I taught kids after school how to build solar cars. Um, and the goal there was 
um, to get students excited about STEM. And um, that was actually, um, initially it was hard because uh, I had never taught before. Um, but once you kind of relate to the kids, it's very easy. Um, you know, kids, regardless of what background they come from, have the greatest ideas. Um, so you ask them a question and they come up with a solution that you could have never thought of. So just that experience working with kids and, you know, um, this ability to make somebody else think is actually very rewarding for you as well. I mean, you know, you show the kids that how you do things in STEM, but then you get you get back to uh, just by instilling in somebody this curiosity or the way to think. So that that was very rewarding. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think sometimes kids don't have that concept of no or that you can't do something. So they definitely have the best ideas. Absolutely. And that's needed sometimes, you know, sometimes you need to have believed that you can do anything that you put your mind to. Mm -hmm, definitely. So the pandemic has been a rough year for everyone. Has it impacted your field in any way? And have there been any challenges that you've had to overcome? Yes, so pandemic has been hard on everyone. Uh, and working in a chemistry lab, you know, you can't do remote work um, because you have to run experiments that you have to be physically there. So for two months, we had to work remotely. Uh, and we focused a lot on uh, applications to the FDA, a lot of paperwork, a lot of data analysis. Um, but at the end of two months, we were like, we're not going anywhere. We can't just sit and not do any experiments. So we did end up going back to the lab. Um, we did get the lab started up and then we hit another wall wherein, okay, we are in the lab, but some of the other people are not in the lab. So how do you deal with that situation? Because uh, we have a very collaborative environment. We need to work with other people to get things done, um, especially getting uh, materials, um, you know, was difficult because there were supply chain issues for everyone, not just us, for everyone. And uh, as the little guy, you know, we are always at the last of the list. Um, and then, uh, you know, some of the supplies that we use, uh, we had to compete with some of the bigger manufacturers. Uh, so that was a very uh, unanticipated, uh, but very interesting learning experience. We um, had to adjust our plans. Uh, to account for the new reality, uh, first of all. And uh, we had to uh, be innovative in our thinking as to what can we accomplish with these constraints? Can we accomplish that? And we were able to kind of ride through the pandemic with that. Um, and that's also a great learning experience, very challenging, but you know, that's also a problem that you're solving. Mm -hmm. Definitely. This issue of remote research and not being able to be in the lab, you know, how do you progress research? So, That's right. um, so what do you see as the future trends in research and development? And as students, what do you think are the areas of growth? Um, the future uh, question is always uh, perplexing to me because um, it's, it's difficult to say what's going to uh, be the next big thing. Uh, also, as a uh, quote-unquote millennial, we went through the largest change in technological advances from a kid to like current. So uh, I'm, I'm very uh, off this question, but I will give it a try. So um, what are the next trends in R&D that I see? I think, uh, and I might be a little bit biased here, I think that chem the need for chemistry or material science will never go away. I think as uh, humans, we have always worked with materials and done amazing things, including build, you know, uh, aircrafts or um, new batteries. And this was all ultimately based in material science. Um, 
you know, in material science, you see the next thing we, we want to build things that are lighter for aircrafts, right? Uh, or we want to build the next newest battery. Maybe we want to build a solar panel that is uh, that can store energy, maybe. Um, or coming closer to you know life sciences, we want to um, use biological molecules um, to build the next drugs, devices, vaccines. So understanding of materials uh, and chemistry is always going to be a need. Um, so that's one field field that you know students can look into. Um, I think that um, the, the trend with biological molecules is interesting, especially since we now have a mRNA vaccine that works amazingly well. I think there's gonna be a lot of funding that's gonna go into mRNA uh, technology to develop drugs and vaccines for cancer and other immune uh, related diseases. So that's uh, an interesting area to get into as well. And um, I also see the trend um, in something like robotics uh, or automation, where you're using um, different fields. You're using mechanics, you're using electronics, and you're using computer science, all working together in cohesion to achieve whatever it's trying to achieve. Maybe it's manufacturing or even robotic surgery. So the understanding of um, how different technologies from different backgrounds come together to work, the understanding, as we call it, as a systems approach, um, you know, that's also something that I see uh, more growth in, um, I, I would say. But, you know, ultimately, to the point that I made before, learn how to be a good scientist. And then even if the future doesn't work out that the way you want, you can always pivot and adapt um, and use those problem solving, critical thinking skills to be successful in life. Um, and you know, one subject that I would recommend everyone to study is statistics. Uh, when I was a kid or when I was an undergrad student, I did not like statistics, but that is probably by far the best and the most important course that you can take in your life. Yeah, and I think this idea of the future is, you know, can be kind of scary, but it's also the amazing thing about STEM is that, you know, the future is unknown. So what is going to be the next big thing? And us as students and researchers, we can contribute to that. Absolutely, you know, um, you will define the future. So, um, you know, I'm excited to see what uh, your viewers, the next, and you, uh, the next scientists and engineers, come up with in the future. Mm -hmm. So, thank you so much for being here, and we'll stay tuned for our next episode. Thank you so much for watching and stay tuned for our next episode on leadership.